there's some elements of this. Well, let's just go right now into the, into the traditional Jewish wedding, and there's a lot of different scriptures we're going to look. You have your notes, actually, two pages today. Then we're going to look at the plot of the wedding. I think you'll enjoy that. And then uh, the separation of the bride and the bridegroom for a time, then the reunion. And you're going to see in the traditional wedding that uh, actually the betrothal was taken, the vows were taken a year before the actual wedding, the nuptials happened. So what, what the bridegroom would do is he would go back and he would build a place for his bride, usually adding a room onto the home of his father and mother, and uh, get ready for that. So, all right, let's, let's start. First of all, let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we celebrate a wonderful reunion with you today, Father, the bride and the bridegroom, I pray that you would just come into this room, bring peace, Lord, bring your joy, bring your love to us today. We receive all that you have for us today. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And a lot of this is receiving. Amen. What do we say about love? The key to love is what? Receiving, isn't it? I hear a little hiss in the background. I don't know what that is. You uh, know what? I think it's probably the air conditioning. Oh, no, no, it was there before. All right. Okay, uh, if you're going to your notes, look on page one. Uh, the ancient Jewish custom and the parallel to the church. Uh, the first element of the Jewish, ancient Jewish wedding was something called the shetitum, or kum, uh, and it's called the match in, in English, that's the Hebrew, and it was initiated by the father. Do you know the fathers in these ancient Jewish homes would initiate the relationship? Often the fathers would choose, both the father, the bride, and the groom would choose for the, for the bride and the groom. Now they would do it with their approval, but that was more the tradition. For example, Abraham, when he decided to get a bride for his son Isaac, he sent Eliezer off to his fathers. He said, I'm not going to let my son marry among the Canaanites. He said, I want my son to marry among our tradition, our family. So he sent Eliezer, his servant, to go fetch a bride for Isaac. Quite a story, great love story in the Bible in, in Genesis chapter 24. And so first of all, the father initiated the relationship. You know the father's heart, God the father, had in his mind before the creation of the world a relationship between you and Jesus? He had chosen us before the what? Foundation of the world. And he set up a way for that relationship to happen through his son Jesus Christ. So this entire idea of wedding and union came from the Father's heart. And one thing you're going to see in this modern Jewish wedding is the love of this Father for His Son. Man, He kisses the Son on the cheek and He dances with Him. And I love that, you know? Do you know, and I, I, was, I said something a couple of teachings ago that I'm going to have to retract. I said, you know, God wanted somebody to demonstrate His love on. That's why He made man. And the Lord showed me that that wasn't true that the Father already had a love relationship with the Trinity. He didn't have to create man to satisfy his need to show love. He'd already shown his love to his Son. In fact, when he introduced his Son on this earth, what did he say? This is my what? My beloved Son. Do you think he loved him from the foundation of the earth? I think he did. Yeah, I think he, he loved him from the foundation of the earth. And so we have the love between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So what's, what about us? Well, I believe that we came out of the heart of all the Trinity, and God wanted some other object beside the Trinity to show His love. So He made man and woman, Adam and Eve, and He did really the first marriage ceremony. The first marriage ceremony was in the garden, right? Where He brought them together. So first of all, we have it initiated by the Father. Secondly, the Father used an agent to bring about the relationship. So what's Eliezer a picture of? The Holy Spirit. What did, what did, how did God draw us into relationship with the Father? Through the Holy Spirit, right? So He sent His Spirit to this earth to draw us into this marriage of the, of the Lamb, marriage with Jesus, the marriage of the bride and the bridegroom. And, the, uh, uh, and He chose us, by the way. What does it say in Ephesians chapter 1? 
We have been chosen. Say, I am chosen. God had me in his mind. Way back at the beginning. And he's delighted to have a relationship with me. I love this. It, it also came with the consent of the bride. Now, part of the tradition of the Jewish wedding was at the betrothal, the groom-to-be, which they would marry almost a year later, the groom-to-be, he would cover his beloved with the veil, and then he would offer the glass of wine underneath the veil. And if she did not drink it, that means she did not want him and want to be married to him. You know, Eliezer did not guarantee that Rebekah would go with him. It was iffy. If you read Genesis chapter 24, he wasn't sure. He left it open. It was really her choice if she wanted to follow him all the way back to Isaac. And so what does God do? Does he force us into a relationship? Do you think the Father makes us? I don't believe so. I believe he shows his love to us. He holds out his hand to us. He offers us the wine cup of acceptance. But we have to drink of it. What does it say in John chapter 1, verse 14? God's grace has appeared to all men, right? That wine cup of God's love and grace is poured out really to all mankind. But as many as what? Received Christ. To them God gave the power to become the sons of God. The whole world doesn't receive. Some people reject it. It's our joy to go tell them about the good news. Amen? We get to tell them about the good news so they have a choice. And so that's one reason that we, uh, we do this. So first of all, well, the first element of the Jewish, ancient Jewish wedding was the match. It was called the match, where it was the bringing together of the bride and groom by the Father. What a beautiful picture of the Father in heaven, isn't it? It's really a story. Now, the second is the, is the bride's price. Do you know that Eliezer came with 10 camels of wealth? It's called, hello, you think he, he, he was trying to make sure that this Rebecca was going to come with him? And so he put out the test. He says, I'm going to go to the well. Now, isn't it interesting that the Shulamite girl found the king because she kept the goats? <laughs> right? It was her outkeeping the goats that allowed the king, Solomon, to see her, to recognize her, and to draw her close to his tent. Isn't it interesting that Rebekah found Isaac by watering the camels? See, sometimes, you know, it's just the common things we do in life that bring close relationship. Isn't that the truth? You may just serve somebody, as you do out here, Ralph. Just serve somebody by doing physical labor. God amazingly uses that. I, I don't understand all about that, but I know that God uses it to draw people together. And, and so here's what Eliezer said. He said, I'm going to put a sign out to God. You remember, I put my sign out when I went to Romania. Remember that? <laughs> and God brought, brought Marianne and myself together. But he put a sign out. Eliezer did. He said, listen, if the woman not only waters my lips with a drink, because I've had a long journey... Do you know how much camels drink? Almost 20 gallons. Do you know that 10 camels, if they were thirsty, could drink 200 gallons of water? Do you think Rebecca had her hands full? So here's Eliezer waiting. He put his camels down on their knees, it says in Genesis 24, and he waited. He said, I'm going to ask God for a sign. There's going to be somebody that come to this well and she's going to draw water, and when she draws water, I'm going to ask her a drink, but I'm not going to say any more than that. But if she offers to water the camels, that's my sign from God that she's the one. So here came Rebecca, and it says she was very beautiful. She came to this well with a pot on her shoulder, and man, she looked at those tin camels. I imagine she could have said, man, I'm going home, you know. Uh, <laughs> but she said, okay, and she watered all the camels. So he waited there, for her to run home and tell her parents, hey, I met somebody at the well. Isn't it interesting? The well of water is a place to meet, isn't it? The living water of Jesus. Yes. How, how much happened at wells in, in ancient Israel? A lot happened. The woman at the well in, in the New Testament. The well seemed to be a gathering place in Israel of, of provision. 
enjoy. And so Rebecca ran home real quickly and told her parents, and they sent a servant out, and they, they brought Eliezer home to the tent of Rebecca's father. Now, Eliezer says, man, everything's going well. I'm getting a nice dinner out of this thing, and my camels are watered. And, and so he began to unload all the beautiful things off these camels. Hey, if you send 10, ten camels full of goods, and he says, my servant Abraham is very, very wealthy. He has secured great lands. He secured a lot of cattle and camels and, and a lot of uh, goods and silver and gold and land. And I've come to find a bride. And by the way, the bride was the daughter of Abraham's brother. This is the daughter of Abraham's brother. So certainly a relative. We're going to match this thing up. And uh, so now he makes an appeal. He makes an appeal to Rebecca's father. Now normally, see, Rebecca's mother knows tradition. She says, let Rebecca remain behind for a while. What does that mean, about a year? Because it was a year of preparation. During that year, the bride would be, prepare herself to meet her, her groom. So it was traditional that after the betrothal, see, Joseph betrothed himself to Mary. In the eyes of Joseph, they were as good as married. Now, they didn't consummate the marriage till a year later. We're going to see that in this, in this series of events in ancient Jewish weddings. And so, uh, but, but as far as the betrothal is concerned, you, that you were as good as married during the betrothal. And you were loyal to your partner and everything else. And so they, they, this is a way of, 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 of completing the relationship. So uh, Rebecca's dad said, okay, can you let, let Rebecca remain? In other words, Ellie, is your park your camels? You're going to have to stay a while. And then Eliezer said one of the greatest verses in the Bible, and I say that, I'll tell you why, because my grandfather gave me that verse before his funeral. I went to see my grandfather at the hospital. He was dying of pneumonia, and he was ready to go. My grandmother was sitting next to him on the bed, and she had uh, her hand on his tummy, and, and he said, Val Jetty, he's German, Val Jetty, he said, I'm going home. And Grandma said, no, no, the doctor said it'll be about two weeks. No, he says, I'm going home. He said, open the drawer. So I opened the drawer next to the bed, and what? My grandfather wrote out his funeral message. That's victory. When you can write out your funeral message, he wanted to make sure I preached it right, right? He says, well, Jetty, he said, I want you to preach my, my funeral. He says, open the drawer. So I opened it up, and guess what the verse was that he chose for his funeral? The verse of Rebecca's father. Here's the verse. Hinder me not, for the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. Is that a powerful wedding verse? Or a, that's uh, in Genesis 24. I'd have to look up the exact verse. Isn't that powerful? Send me away that I may go to my master. He was ready to go. He didn't want to stay behind on this earth. I think, he said, I'll be going, he said, Jerry, I'm going to go in three days. And he did. He died in three days. He didn't die. He passed. Forgive me, Lord, not dead. He passed in three days. Glorious funeral. I mean, I, th this man loved God. I remember two things about my grandfather. He always had real long whiskers, because when I had kissed him, and it was our German tradition that all the grandkids had to kiss the grandfather when they came into the room. <laughs> Tradition. You're going to see it in Jewish. Everybody's kissing everybody on that Jewish wedding, man. You're going to see that. They're the kissing us bunch I've ever seen. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, you know, I remember the whiskers, but I also remember my grandfather. He thought God spoke German. He had an old German Bible, and every time I remember going into his house the latter years of his life, he always had that German Bible on his lap. He loved, loved the Word of God. Oh, I remember one other thing about my grandfather. He traveled among the German Brotherhood all through America, Oskosh, Wisconsin, um, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. There were all these German communities that had come out of Russia during the early 1900s that had settled in America, and they all had their tradition back to Germany, and they maintained that. They called it the German Brotherhood here in America. And my grandfather would travel around America in, in, in an old Buick. Why do I drive a Buick, right? So he's going into Chicago. It's a true story. And the police pull him over. And uh, why? Because on the interstate, the minimum, air, uh, the minimum speed is 
40 miles an hour. My grandfather was not in a hurry. <laughs> Definitely didn't inherit that from him. Um, he was going too slow on the interstate. So the police pulled him over. And just, they weren't going to ticket him. They just were going to say, speed up a little bit. So here's what he said to the policeman. This is my grandfather's mentality. Well, he said, thank you for stopping me. He said, do you know where the German brothers meet? Chicago policeman knows where the German brotherhood meet, you know, in a city of three million people, right? My grandfather's world was around people that love God, you know, and I cherish him. But I thought this was a wonderful verse that he used. Isn't that a powerful word, uh, funeral verse? I keep saying wedding because it was a wedding for him. And so we have the, the ancient wedding. It's called the bride's price. So here came the ten camels loaded, loaded with goods for Rebecca's father. Eliezer wanted to make sure that she knew, he knew, that Rebecca wasn't going to be taken off into a foreign country and abandoned and not taken care of. Because he demonstrated great wealth to Rebecca's father. And so, uh, great story here. And, uh, and let me ask you a question. What was the price that was paid for the bride? What was the price that the father paid for the bride? Us. His son. If he has not given us his, his son, can he not with him also freely give us all things? Do you think the down payment for our wedding with the son, which was the blood of Jesus and the life of his own son, was a great payment? I guess so. <laughs> Probably the greatest payment that was ever brought to a bride. Look at what the Father has done for us. What he has given us. Come on. That's awesome, isn't it? It is totally awesome. So uh, the second part of the ancient Jewish wedding is called the Mohar. Mohar, which is the price that was paid for the bride. And it was paid to the father of the groom. All right. And uh, so the Mohar was paid. And, and we know that the great price was paid for our salvation. And you know what the price reflected? Watch this. The price always reflected the worth of the bride. Did you get that? The price that the groom's father paid to get the bride always reflected the value that was pay, placed on the bride. How much does God love us? How much, does God love us? Wow. how much value, get this, how much, and I'm ready to fly away. How much value does God place on us, his bride, by the price that was paid for us? Come on. Can you say amen, somebody? Good night. What else could he have done? Nothing more. He gave us the creator of all the universe. He gave us the heir of all things. All things are created by Jesus and for him. He's made us a joint heir with him. As Jesus is in heaven, so are we on this present earth. Did God pay a great price? Wow. For this salvation. I'm excited. So the second part of the ancient Jewish wedding was called the Mohar, or the bride's price. Now the third element of the ancient Jewish wedding was called the Matan. Matan were the gifts that were born. I've already mentioned these. These were love gifts. And you know, if you were poor in, in Israel and didn't have a lot to give the bride, it was okay. It was a voluntary thing. There was never a, quote, price put on the gifts that were to be brought. But again, they demonstrated the value that the bridegroom's father placed on the bride that was going to marry his son. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful story. And then the fourth element is called the dowry. Now, this was what was prepared for the bride herself. This is not what the bridegroom father brought to the bride. This was the dowry that the father had been saving up from the time this little girl was born. You know what a dowry is. It was her treasure chest from her father. And it was to be given at the wedding. And it was, it, it was, it's a beautiful picture of the gifts of the Spirit that the Father has given us to walk with His Son. Isn't that exciting? The nine gifts of the Spirit, a supernatural gifts, the, the, the manifestation gifts, the mo motivational gifts of Romans 12. Think of all the gifts God's poured out upon us. Does He love us? Can you say it this morning? Say, I am valuable. I am valuable. 
I know it doesn't sound right. I know it doesn't sound right. I am valuable to God. Look what he gave me. Look what he provided for me. Look what he's given me. He's given me an inheritance called the Holy Spirit. It was the first down payment of his salvation, Ephesians 1.21. It's called, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And it's called the down payment of his inheritance. He gives us the Holy Spirit to show that he's going to follow all the way through with us. So the dowry for the bride. Say, I've been blessed. I've been blessed. <laughs> with many gifts. Grace of God. Peace of God. Love of God. I am blessed. I'm about ready to sing. Come on. Are we blessed? If you get nothing out of this this morning, look at, look at the value that God has placed on you as his bride. I just love teaching this stuff. Don't you like this merit? Isn't this good stuff? Don't you like this, Stephanie? Come on. We, he loves us. And so uh, this is Shehelium, which was the dowry. And uh, then, then the fifth area was a ketuva, B is the, the ketuva, which was the marriage contract. Now you're going to see in this picture, this video of this modern Jewish wedding, that the elders gather around the groom and they put together a contract. I mean, this Jewish, the Jewish wedding is serious. And written in the marriage contract are all the things that the groom promises the bride. All the things he's going to do for her, he's going to provide for her, he's going to take care of her, he's going to watch over her, he's, go he's going to love her. So this is really a marriage contract. They enter into a serious contract. I don't know why the wife doesn't have to sign anything, but the groom does. And you're going to see it in this picture of this, this Jewish wedding I'm going to show you. You'll see all the elders gather around the groom, and they are signing, and he signs his name. So I'll bet these elders, if you don't take care of your wife, come back on you later. And they bring this marriage contract. And by the way, this marriage contract is rolled up. Just simply rolled up. It's a piece of parchment. It's fairly large. I don't know all the things they put on that. I'd like to see one of these marriage contracts that the Jewish weddings required and the elders required and the fathers required. The bride, the rest of the ceremony, carries that. She carries it rolled up in her hands. You'll see it on this, in this video. Uh, you'll see her carry this, the rest of, I mean, not the whole ceremony, but most of the ceremony, she's holding that covenant in her hand. Now, let me ask you, what's our marriage contract? The what? The what? The Bible. Come on, the what? The Bible. Do you know that God wrote a marriage contract for us? And that we can hold him accountable for everything he's promised? Oh, yes. Hello. If you don't know the promises, you're not going to come back on him. Remember what we said in Daniel when I was teaching on Daniel where God says, command you me. God asks us as his bride to command back to him his promises. Now, I, you know, I know my kids, man... They'll forget a lot of things. They never forget promises I make to them. Hello, anybody at home? You know what I mean? I, you say, well, did I say that? That was a year ago. How did you remember that? How many know they don't, don't forget promises? It's somehow embedded in their mind because they've already spent the promise. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, they've already got it. It was like my daughter, and I have to give a wonderful report. I broke down at the Jet Tech meeting yesterday and choked all up thinking about this but we had been making our daughter a promise for years uh, of an automobile at her graduation and quite frankly I mean things were looking a little thin you know what I mean by thin and uh, you know we had an, some money but not enough to buy a car and, and I just don't want to go in debt how many know this is a year of jubilee how many know this is no time to go in debt no time to go in debt it's time for God to free us from debt and so I, I told Marianne, I said, you know, graduation's coming up in, in a month and a half, and she's already registered at university, and thank God she's got really good grades, so she got almost a full scholarship to USF, and, and, uh, but we do have to pay for her dorm, but she just got a job, which I'm going to have to leave today to, for her job 
her first day on the job. I'm going to have to leave by, by 1 o'clock today, so you have to forgive me. I'm sorry. We're buying her a car this weekend, and I'll tell you how, how this happened. My, my wife's uncle bought a farm next to Temeshwara in Romania. And he tried farming it with this share farmer, and the guy just blew it. It just wasn't working. And so somebody came along and said, Tony, you own land right next to the city limits. Why don't you put together a housing development? It was 160 acres. <laughs> wow. So he went out and he hired this tractor and they just made roads out there, you know, lots out there. There's no water, there's no electricity, there's nothing out there, just these square lots, right? And as part of my wife's inheritance, she inherited 11 of those lots. Well, a week ago or two weeks ago, a couple comes along looking at all these lots, must be 30 some lots out there, and they go and stand on my wife's lot. And they said, this is the lot we want. We're going to build a house here. And guess what? My wife flew to Washington yesterday because she had to go sign a power of attorney at the Romanian embassy. So she flew to Washington, D.C., spent the day there and came home last night and signed this document, which went to Romania this morning. And I won't tell you how much, but <laughs> it'll buy a nice car for our daughter. Is God faithful? Is God faithful? God is the way maker. Say, he's my way maker. He's going to make a way for you. He's going to make a way for you. When there seems like no road in the wilderness, he's going to what? He's going to make a way for you. Why? Because he's our father and he what? He loves us. And he's already made a down payment for us with his own son. Will he not with him also freely give you all things? Forgive me, Lord, for getting up tight. <laughs> Because it was a promise I made to my daughter. And I'm going to stand with my promises. And I told God, I don't want to borrow any money. So you're going to have to bring this supernatural. Say, God is faithful. He, who, he who called you will perform it. This is his performance contract. If he said it, he will do it. Get you, get, if you get nothing out of this, look at the marriage contract this morning. If he said it, he will do it. Hold him to it. He loves that when you put him to the test. He loves that when you say, hey God, you said in your word and I'm going to stand on it. I'm going to believe it. I don't care what the circumstances look like. I don't care what I might see with my natural eyes or hear with my natural ears. I'm going to go with what I know in your contract. Let me ask you a question. Do you think God puts together good contracts? Do you think if he said it, he will do it? All right, believe it. All right, don't you love this? So the fifth element of the ancient Jewish wedding was called the marriage contract. And when I show you the video, you'll love this. All right, now the, the sixth area, let me put my glasses on here. I have, by the way, a lot of scriptures. I challenge you before this week's out, go through all these scriptures that I put beside the ancient Jewish wedding and the different elements. I, I was going to do that and I've actually printed them out. But I thought, you know, if I read every one of those scriptures, we'll be here for two hours. So... But take, take this sheet, I put a lot of study into this, uh, take the sheet and go through the scriptures and, and study them, look at them. These are yours. This is your stuff. <laughs> All right, now the third is called the betrothal. Kiddushum in the Hebrew. It was sealed with a couple of acceptance. What the bridegroom would do is he would bring the wine to the bride and he would have her drink out of the cup, and then she would take the cup, as you'll see in this wedding, and she would offer it to him. And by the way, every time you take communion, you are betrothing yourself again to Jesus. Is this good or what? Doesn't mean you're getting married all over again. It just means every time you take communion, you are restoring your Vows. Thank you. You're restoring your vows to Jesus. Man, I'm gonna, I, I just feel like dancing. 
You know, and we're going to dance in a few minutes here. When I just studied this and I thought, everybody's going to really enjoy this. It's called the cup of the new covenant. Do you know it's better than any covenant that's ever been established on planet Earth? Communion is called the cup of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. Wow. That's enough to make you shout, isn't it? And you know what happens at the betrothal? After the betrothal, the bridegroom leaves the bride for a year. He, the betrothal is, he, he, this is the vow he makes that he's going to marry her. This is the engagement period. And he goes and prepares a place for the bride. Hello? Hello, anybody home? Jesus said in John 14, Be not afraid, do not fear. It is necessary for you that I what? Go away. So as the bridegroom would leave the bride, he'd say, Honey, I'll be back. I'll be back, but I'm going to go and prepare a place that where I am, you may be also. Wow, this is good stuff. And so he would go home, like I say, and he would build on a place on his father's house, because this is how the Jewish people did it in the ancient Israel. He would build a house on, or a, a room onto his father's house, and then he'd make all preparations to receive this bride into this room. What a beautiful picture of Jesus. It is necessary for you that I go away, for if I go not away, I will not come again. Again, I will receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Do we have a winning contract here? Oh, yes. Is this kind of a good deal? I think do you think we are you think we are the beneficiaries of something pretty exciting and incredible? Do you think this ancient Jewish wedding is any kind of a picture of the glory of that is our glory as a bride of Christ today? Come on. Whew. Give me a break. Now, during this, this time, by the way, this, this year that he would go and prepare a place for his bride, she had to go through a, a ceremonial cleansing. It's actually a purification of washing, they would call it in Israel, where she would purify her, her body, herself, her mind, prepare to receive her husband, her, her bridegroom. Now, they say, and it's tradition, that on the Jewish wedding day, the bride and the groom had reached a high point of spiritual awareness. You're going to see that in the wedding. That, that, that they, this, in fact, it is so recognized in the ancient Jewish wedding that the bride pronounces blessings on all the women around her that want a blessing. She has reached such a high point of spirituality in preparation. Ooh, this is good stuff. In preparation for the bridegroom, that she has prepared herself to receive him and has become so intensely spiritual before God, waiting on God, reading the blessings, reading the Torah, that the, the women in the wedding ceremony before the bridegroom is brought to her, the women will come to her and she will speak a blessing over them. This is good stuff. Are we to be a blessing as the bride? Are we, to, are we to separate ourselves unto God? Yes. Has He not made us a chaste virgin, prepared, ready to receive? Yes. I mean, we are blessed to bless others. And so here we have this beautiful element. We're set apart. We're purified by the washing of the what? The Word and the blood of Jesus. I've said at every one of these teachings on the Song of Solomon, do you understand the extent that God goes through to prepare the bride for His Son? To present us holy, blameless, faultless, pure in His sight? So this is a holy time. The wife just doesn't waste her time waiting a year for her husband to come back. Now, what's really interesting, by the way, and this is true in, in the ancient Jewish wedding. The bride never knew the moment of the bridegroom's return. She would kind of know the season. But part of the Jewish tradition was they were not to announce a specific time. In other words, 
the bride's going to come by with his couch and he's going to pick you up at three, uh, three o'clock on Friday after. It didn't happen. So the bride had to always trim her lamps to be ready for the coming of the bridegroom. And you know when it generally happened? At midnight. Traditionally, the ancient Jewish wedding or, or, or receiving of the bride by the, by the bridegroom upon the father's request. See, the son could not go to receive the bride until the father said he was ready. Hey, a lot's hanging on the old dad here, isn't it, in the ancient Jewish stuff? Didn't the fathers have good standing? I hate what's happened to fathers. Part of my prophecy for 2017 was this, that God was going to cause an awakening this year. And the first awakening God showed me. I, I, I always fast and pray between, between Christmas and New Year's. And the Lord gave me seven things that were going to be awakened this year. And you know, the first thing God gave me was awakening of fathers in America. The renewal of the place of the father in the home and in life. And I spoke, and check my prophecy out on my channel. You'll get blessed. I say, Dad, stand up. It's time to stand up and be a man and be the man that God's called you to be. Stop letting this women's movement uh, destroy and emasculate you. Come on, it's a work of Satan that's trying to take down the role that God placed on fathers. You about ready to clap there, Christy? Yeah. I say it again, dads, rise up. Stop being a wimp. Stand for what's true and righteous by, by yourself living a holy life. Start there. So your children can look at you and your wife can look at you with respect. If your wife doesn't respect you, why? You know, live a kind of life before her. Wouldn't hurt for her to walk in you, uh, in, in you sometime and see on, on your knees beside the bed. Wouldn't hurt for her to see that you're interceding for the family. Hello? Is this true or what? Am I talking truth this morning? So the son, the, girl, the bridegroom, could not go to fetch his bride until the father said, you're re she's ready and you're ready. That doesn't mean that Jesus isn't ready. Because, but, but no man knows the what? The day or the hour of the return of the Son of Man. But we know the season. We're not children of darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief, says God. So there's signs that things are getting ready. Huh? Hello? The bridegroom's finished the place now beside his father's tent, and he goes and talks to his dad and said, Dad, guess what? It's been a year now since I became betrothed. Coming up time now for me to go get my bride. I, th I imagine the father and the son are talking about this, don't you think, in heaven? And Jesus is saying, you know, Dad, what do you, what do you think? Thinks it's about time I dip down there and pick up this gang? That's a little rough, isn't it? Uh, you think it's about time that I go down in the clouds? See, now the, the hoopa was a picture of clouds, right? The covering. It was a covering. The hoopa was a covering. It was held by four relatives of the, of the bride and the bridegroom. Four relatives would hold, hold it up and the bride and the groom would get under that covering. Well, I'll tell you what, we are under the cloud, the cloud of God's glory and protection and the coming of Jesus in the clouds, amen? That's going to happen. So this is beautiful typology. Isn't there a lot of typology between the ancient Jewish wedding and uh, did, is it? Oh, not now. What, you know, don't you love this stuff? Okay. All right. I, not now. Oh, still up? Okay. Takes a minute to get around there. Sorry, Facebook friends. All right. So we have the marriage contract. We have the betrothal. Now we have the nuptials. Now we have the great celebration, the coming together of the bride and the bridegroom. We have the anticipation, the purification, the preparation of the bride and the bridegroom for this time. And one thing you're going to see in this Jewish wedding, I wish the Facebook, go to my Facebook channel, because I put it on my Facebook channel at the top of my worship channel. If you're watching here when we go offline in just a moment, and if you're watching Facebook, uh, go to my channel, J. Brandt, B-R-A-N-D-T, for him. Go to that channel and play this Jewish wedding. Just play this thing. It's this, one of the most marvelous weddings I've ever seen. Glorious, this couple, the way they, this family celebrated the joy, the love. Everybody's receiving each other, welcoming each other in the family. It's just fun. I love it. I want to go to a Jewish wedding just to have fun. Get your dancing shoes on. Glory to God. Man alive, our weddings are so solemn. 
I'm going to have me, listen, at 25, our 25th anniversary is coming up. I think I'm going to have me a Jewish wedding, just, just to catch up. Amen? All right. <laughs> then finally, we have the nuptials, all right? Now, the groom's father decides when he may return for the bride, as I mentioned. And it's always at an unexpected time. You know why? Because he wants to make sure that the bride is anticipating, exciting, waiting, and doesn't always know. There's kind of a mystery and adventure about this whole event. Is it going to be tonight? Is the groom, bridegroom coming for me tonight? She must ask that many nights. But one of the nights, it's going to happen, so get ready, all right. And, and then she gets abducted. The traditional Jewish wedding is the bride gets abducted. Isn't this fun? God is so, he has so much fun with romance, doesn't he? I mean, he's a hopeless romantic. All right. And um, uh, so we get abducted. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, right? The dead in Christ shall rise and we'll, we'll be caught up. And we have the abduction of the bride. And then we have her finely dressed and crowned. Actually, they put a crown on the bride. Isn't this beautiful? They put a, a, a beautiful gold crown on the bride as the ancient part of the Jewish wedding. And what has God done for us? He's made us a kingdom of what? Priests. Kings and priests. priests unto our God. He's given us a royal crown. Isn't that wonderful? He's not a miser. You think God's broke? All the silver and the gold is His. He's ready to pour it out. I'm ready to receive. For the kingdom, amen? This is a season of the bride getting blessed. So we can bless the others out there that need Jesus. Amen? So he's finally dressed and crowned, or she is. And then the marriage feast. Now they have a feast. Whoa, you'll see in this video. This is a feast. All right. And guess what? We're going to have a marriage feast of the Lamb. Revelation says when Jesus comes back for us, we're going to have a marriage feast that's going to be nonstop. Amen? Going to be glorious. We're going to celebrate with him. Yeah, aren't you glad that God loves feasts? Man, he just loves feasts. And, Mary, uh, and Nancy has more feasts out here. There's always something cooking. Always something cooking out here. Uh, we love feasts. Do you know that a lot of Jesus' ministry happened around feasts? He invited himself over to their house. He heard they were having a feast. He said, I'm coming over. <laughs> to Matthew's house. Matthew was a tax collector. Man, this guy had big feasts. Zacchaeus was up a tree. A lot of people are up a tree today. Amen. They need a visitation of Jesus to their house. He says, come on down out of that tree, Zacchaeus. I'm going to your house today. We're going to have a feast. I think Jesus just liked to eat. You know what I mean? Just, just had a lot of fun celebrating. He loved to see his family having a good time around the table. Isn't it interesting? The first thing we're going to do when we leave this earth is we're going to have a feast. I receive, Lord. Yeah, golden corral in heaven. Amen. All you can eat. Let's go for it. <laughs> All right, the marriage feast. And then the bride and the groom are led together. Now, when the bride comes in, or the groom comes in, by the way, the, the, the bride does not see the groom at the first. He's brought in by the two fathers. They're on each arm, and they, they accompany him in, into the wedding room, and into the marriage celebration. And, and the bride is off to the, the side. Like I say, she's blessing the, the women because she's at her heightened space and of spirituality and recognized as such by the other women that are present. And, and so she is not seen. And so he then goes over and places a veil on her. He puts a veil on her and go, they go through their ceremony. And now seven blessings are pronounced by the elders of Israel that are present. Seven blessings are pronounced over the bride and the groom. That's part of the ancient ceremony. Isn't that exciting? So we're going to read in a few moments, you're going to read Deuteronomy 28, and we're going to, seven of you are going to read each a different blessing that God promised us, his Israel, amen? We are, are we the son, children of Abraham? Do you think Abraham's blessings could come actually upon us? How about Abraham's blessings mixed with the new covenant blessings? I mean, let's just mix them all together, huh? 
Because we have a better contract with Jesus than even Abraham or Moses or angels or anywhere else. So it, it, we can add on to the Abrahamic blessings, the blessings of Jesus Christ. Peace with God, peace of God. Come on, this is a good stuff. What a deal. I, I just, the more I talk about this deal, the better I like it. You know what I mean? Hello, I think I'll stay with it. Y'all want to stay with it? I think we'll stay with it. And then the bride and the groom are led together at the end of the ceremony. They're led by all the people into their room, that room that the groom had prepared for a year. They're led into the room. Now, symbolically, you'll see in this wedding, they're led into a room. They stay for about 20 minutes, and then they come out. And when, when they come out, she, she runs through this beautiful, uh, these, these coverings of flowers and everything. She runs through there, and they start their dance, and they 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 dance. And the men dance. Man, I don't know how they, how they learn all these moves with the feet. They must practice a lot. They must go to a lot of weddings. But I'll tell you what, the Jewish people love to dance. And you know what? I think it's time for the bride of Christ to start dancing. Yes. You're going to see how the father dances over the son. Woo! The father dances over the son in this video. He loves us and he kisses him, continually kissing his son. He just loves him. He's celebrating him. And then the son dances over the bride. You'll see it in a few minutes. I love this stuff. This is all a picture of the joy of the Lord is our what? Strength. Don't cast your face down to the ground and say, I'm just a nobody and I'm worthless and nothing's ever working out for me. Boo-hoo for you. Start celebrating. Maybe you ought to set up a dance room in your house. Just get alone with God, turn on the music and start dancing. Start shedding some of this off your back. The Jewish weddings can have this kind of celebration. I think the bride of Christ ought to. Just a joyous occasion of joy and pleasure and peace and celebrating what God has done. Celebrating what God has done. Now you have learned about the ancient Jewish wedding. Isn't this good? So now I'm going to turn off our Facebook friends. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Go again to my channel, J. Brandt for him on YouTube. And play, with, if you would right now, take a few minutes, leave the, the Facebook channel, go to the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel. By the way, subscribe for me. I'm almost at 1,000 subscribers. And if you would subscribe, I'd really appreciate it because it'll take me to the 1,000. Then I can broadcast also on YouTube along with Facebook. And we can keep multiplying our group here. We've been getting almost 100 people into this teaching. Isn't this exciting? So we're multiplying out of this place now. I praise God and pray it'll go to 1,000. Amen. We can go worldwide with this thing if we just pass it on. So Facebook friends, thank you for joining. And we're going to shut you off. And then I'm going to turn the video on here for everybody that's here. All right. So God bless you. All right.